Hey guys, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App. I am joined by Jordan Klein and CJ Eller this evening. We are going to be talking about Borges' Pierre Menard, the author of the Quixote. Is that is that the correct title? That is the correct title. Okay. All right. So, I never heard of this before. This was a selection that CJ recommended for us to take up and discuss. Um, I'm glad that he did because I think it perfectly illustrates many of the ideas, though I don't know how it's all going to work out just yet because... I don't have a script here. We're going to just sort of have a free-flowing discussion yeah. with our conversations that you can also find on the Noetic app in regards to Roland Barthes, The Death of the Author, Michel Foucault's What is an Author, and Derrida, Structure, Sign, and Play. So we'll try to bring those influences into this conversation. I also know that CJ has uh, some topics that he wants to cover, and we'll see. This may be very short. This may be very long. We don't. I don't know. I've never discussed this before. Um, because I don't think we can assume that the audience knows this piece. I mean, I'm 36 years old. Never heard of this thing until two days ago. Hmm. I think we need to give a brief recap of it. Um, I can do that. CJ can do that. Jordan can yeah. do that. We can all do it together. And just to preface, it's Peter Menard, author of Don Quixote. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought mine said, oh. the, mine said the Quixote. Oh, well, the P, yeah, the P, oh, okay, the, my cool. PDF did. It doesn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it could be just a function of translation. Or yeah, a, yeah. There's a number of translations and editions. Um, so anywho, um, okay. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just start this off. What's very interesting about Pierre Menard is that it's put into a form unlike anything that I've ever seen. Okay. Mm. Stylistically, we are given something that is kind of a hybrid, maybe I would say, between an academic journal essay. And a bit of a eulogy. Because mm -hmm. what's interesting here, we have a narrator who feels that it is his duty to come to the defense of the recently deceased Pierre Menard mm -hmm. to laud his his visible accomplishments. I believe there's like 20 different things in terms of like sonnets and definitions and a variety of other literary works. But also something that n not too many people know about. Mm -hmm. Right? And this was his really revolutionary thing that he did. Which was he in a fragmentary style copied? Well, I don't want to know if I want to use the word copy. That could mm -hmm. become important. word for word, line for line reconstruction of Cervantes' Don Quixote in, uh, I believe, in a couple chapters, the ninth and thirty-eight chapters, and a fragment from chapter twenty-two. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he says that this is his masterwork. Okay, but also Pierre Menard says that this is not a transcription. It's not an update. It's not a reimagining of Don Quixote. It's not Don Quixote for uh, the the nineteenth or twentieth century or whatever time period we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. When 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 um, and uh, yeah. So I, I, this is interesting. Um, this is kind of madness. Now, so <laughs> so we have this narrator talking about Pierre Menard, defending him from detractors, um, and he's he, he lauds Pierre Menard for sort of creating this revolutionary act of writing where he takes something and something as popular as Cervantes' Don Quixote and puts his own name to it, attributes it to himself. And there, there's a passage in the short story where he's like, take a look at these two passages, right? And they are mere images of one another. There's nothing different from the fragments that Pierre Menard created and what Don Quixote created. So that is my... A, a very uh, rough summation of what I believe the plot, air quotes, of this eulogy academic journal is. Now, we can go into greater... There are many, many layers, right? Yes. There's some bricolage going on here, right? You know, as Derrida would say, there are being pot shards sewn, uh, or glued together, right? from a variety of different sources. He drops tons of French writer names. There are little footnotes. There are little subtexts and things like that, which I'm sure CJ has picked up on and wants to probably say something about that, that are very important. I don't know the significance of them. Um, maybe CJ will say something. But I'm going to stop talking right now and mm -hmm. let, allow Jordan and CJ to perhaps add something to the summation I've given. Sure. Well, I think I want to emphasize that this isn't just Pierre Menard writing his name on the Don Quixote. So we're not, he's not, he's not stealing 
Don Quixote, but he likes the task. And it's funny because he puts it as a game. So like the game I, I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take this spontaneous work and I'm trying to produce it. I'm trying to produce the same pages that a 17th century, you know, ex-soldier is trying to produce and what would seem necessary and inevitable and reasonable in the 17th century and I'm trying to do it in the 20th century which would seem almost irrelevant or I think he's quote unquote impossible so we have this I think what he calls is a solitary game mm-hmm. of sorts to try to reconstruct literally Cervantes's spontaneous work so we're not even just talking about reappropriation he's talking about trying to get inside and not even get inside Quixote's mind because that's another thing too because he's like well like how do I do this right like I don't know Jordan like would you just like learn Spanish and yeah I mean go I back know, in like... time yeah how do you be like would you just be Cervantes like I want to like be Cervantes and like hate the Turks and the Moors and go off and pretend that like the time between six, 1602 and, and 1918 now. didn't mm. exist and like He's like, yeah, it's like... Yeah, I always thought of it kind of like almost like uh, when you uh, do like a historical restoration on a house, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you're not the original builder, but then you're trying to be as authentic with it as possible, but you're still trying to put it together kind of like plank by plank with like the, you know, with like the same maple, like regionally sourced. It's... Yeah, like I had a hard time wrapping my head around the whole like reconstruct like reconstructing the text without totally just copy and pasting it. <laughs> sure, because I mean the thing is like it, it, with with something like that of just like being that Spanish, you know, person like, you know, and, and trying to be Cervantes is like that's almost like he says like it's like too easy, too obvious, you know, it's impossible. Like we said like mm-hmm. you can't go back to the 16th century, but in some way, he can try to bring his own life into crafting these, and that's the, that's the fascinating part. He's like, okay, if I can't if I can't be Cervantes, then maybe I can come to Don Quixote by being myself. Right. So he says he has yeah. two, he has he has two options. Right. Yeah. We've alluded to them already. He can go right. back. He can. He can do recreate the entire life of Cervantes in order to sort of recreate this thing. He can't do it. He I, is a Corsican. Is that is that the language that he briefly masters and then abandons it? Or he can relate to Quixote by via being Pierre Menard. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, I love you it. know. I I think there's actually what's interesting here is I think if we try to read meaning into it. We're in some ways. Um, illustrating probably something that the that this particular sort of text is trying to get us to break out of specifically the search for something meaningful mm-hmm. now what seems to be meaningful is the revolutionary act of the writing the fact that that someone would claim that they've done something new and different by copying or whatever the word i don't know what words to use here producing the pages lifting Li- he's not even lifting he's he is writing Don like he's not writing another Don Quixote. He's writing like the Don Quixote. He's not and he's not even producing a manacle. He's not doing a transcription of the original. He's producing the pages. Like not even like copy and pasting. It's almost just like he is actually writing it out for the first time. What's already there? Well, the only thing that's different, <laughs> right? The only thing that the only thing that's different, right? The words are the exact same, right? Right. So I'm I, I'm gonna say he's a thief, all right? He's transcribing, he's copying, Ta-da! but but all right, but the but but what he does differently is that he brings a set of experiences and a new meaning and a new association to those words that he copies. That give them a new hue and a different interpretation, right? It's like okay. a different nuance. Right. So yeah. so when Pierre Menard assigns his name to the exact same things that Don Quixote did, they perhaps, at least in the mind of this eulogizing narrator, he says that he prefers, he mm-hmm. prefers Pierre Menard's 
take mm -hmm. on the Quixote. Doesn't he call it? It's like oh, a more subtle rendition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's an interest. Maybe we can talk about this one interesting part where he says, um, I think he just takes out, I think it's chapter 38. And he says, okay, like in this chapter, Don Quixote deals with the subject of arms and letters, right? And he says, well, Don Quixote in that passage or in that chapter passes judgment you know against letters and he says like you know arms are the best way to go and then there's this little part where all his friends are sort of talking about it or at least you know, and and one person i think um and there's all these different interpretations that people see and and it's funny he's like you know he goes through all these different one one person says like oh there's the the influence of nietzsche there right you know if you think of like nietzsche in the sense of like you know words versus arms i don't i don't i don't know maybe where that connection is in regards to nietzsche but somebody's like i hear nietzsche in it and and to me to my mind maybe that seems right and then there's all these other ones but then i guess one of the reasons was like and others others will find a transcription of the don of don quixote where it's like you can make all these different things and then other people are just going to say oh it's just a transcription mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe and maybe that's mm -hmm. partly why I'm trying to fight against the idea of like it being a transcription because he wrote this out, and yet other people would be like, "Wait, that's like like you said, like wait, that's just like he just copied that." There's but the, a, but the eulogizer's like, "No, he didn't. He actually just wrote it out, and we have to you know assess it." What were you gonna say? Yeah, there's Jordan? a theory that might sort of help us sort of like tease this out because mm -hmm. it's uh this idea of intertextuality where you mm. each time you read something you pretty much almost innovate it by inserting yourself in the text and adding your own sort of layers of interpretation and your own thoughts and stuff like that so maybe there's kind of like a little bit of that going on in the act of writing itself mm -hmm. yeah i think jordan's right i think what jordan so what i so so first of all i think what Borges probably do in doing here is um, demonstrating what's very in vogue at the time where people are just appropriating things all over the place. Um, I searched around a couple of websites. One that I particularly enjoyed was um, about.com and I can really recommend them for doing analyses and things like that. But I mean, T.S. Eliot mm -hmm. was, was, was someone who was um, uh, very good at doing this and um, uh, Duchamp, right? With his yeah. putting his urinal in, in in the museum or whatever. That's something that I got from this, right? You're just taking something and putting it somewhere else and totally changing the context and giving it a new meaning, right? So the, a urinal is a urinal until you put it behind a velvet rope, right? It has a whole new context. Um, I think what's more important is what Jordan's talking about is the fact that this whole thing is in a way illustrating many of the ideas that Bart and Foucault and Derrida have done is that what exactly counts as an author doesn't really matter very much. And whatever, if there is a sinner, uh, it is more of a principle than a person. And that at the end of the day, searching for meaning from the Derridian perspective in this essay is a farce mm -hmm. and really we are going on a wild goose chase if we try to quote unquote make sense of Borges's essay mm -hmm. like eat the text itself that really Borges, Borges's essay should just be delighted in enjoyed it should be the free play of ideas so when he does little footnotes or in notes or a little quotation here and there or has these all these different the multiplicity of characters or mm -hmm. whatever it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to have a point contained within it. It just has to be like kind of cool. And it is kind of cool. It just has to be like kind of beautiful. And in, in its way it is. But maybe we should tease out how how some of these ideas link up to some of our from what we've done on Bart and Foucault and Derrida. So what was the big deal about Bart, right? Um you know, Bart talked about the author being this capitalist construct and that, you know, people will always sort of examine the details of a person's life to get at some sort of secret meaning that is buried within the text, right? Um, 
but ultimately, you know, Bart comes through a multiplicity of methods. You know, Bart talks about how modern writers are able to kill off the author, and that really anything about the author is totally inconsequential, and which is illustrated by the fact that we can swap out these different authors by the by the Quixote, and all we're left with is the writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the writing is 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 the thing. The work is the thing. But then comes Foucault, right? Then comes Foucault, and he says, "Well, this won't do. This won't do. That having this this work, this writing, right? Because there's something still theological about this. We're elevating the work to this like this high status, and we're creating this cluster of principles known as the author function that can account for certain types of writing. There's still going to be a center there. So when Pierre Menard puts his name on the Quixote and Cervantes does, you get totally different interpretations. And that's why the narrator prefers the fragmentary Quixote of, of, uh, of uh, Menard. Pierre Menard to that of Cervantes, right? And then we get Derrida, right, who's all about decentering things, right? And he's going to destroy this whole concept of there being authorial intent and principles and stuff like that. And all we're left with is to admire the ornamental swapping out of signs and signifiers. So that's what I thought this text did, was that in its own way allowed for each of those theoretical lenses that we looked at to have some credibility. So on one level, we can, read, we can, have, we can do a BART reading. On another level, we can do a Foucault reading. And then on another level, we can do a Duridian reading. And that's kind of fun. That's kind of cool. But beyond that, <laughs> I, don't have any, I don't have anything else to say about it. Yeah. Except maybe to talk about why it's so delightful. What does he do that's so cool about this piece of literature? If I were to take the Derrida perspective and talk about its merits, right? Just as like this musical composition that Jordan alluded to that we create when we bring our own set of concepts and feelings and emotions to it. You know, what jumped out to you? I think we can talk about why we like this piece of writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, and I think maybe to go off of that and maybe to include the the first idea of, you know, what can we put in, you know, what what can we look for in Bart and Foucault and Derrida? There is this idea at the end where the author says, well, or I guess the narrator, author, whatever you want to call him, says, you know, like, well, Menard, you know, probably without without wishing to actually enrich the idea of reading is that we can make these yes. deliberate, anachronistic, and, you know, erroneous authorships, right? Where we can say, okay, what if, and I'll, I'll use some of the examples, you know, like, what if something like, I don't know, the Imitation of Christ, which I think is just some... Yeah, Christ on Wall Street. Right. Is that the example he or, uses? Or no, I think he uses, like, what if, like, let's say, like, I'm going to, like, switch out the Imitation of Christ. Like, what if the Gospel of John was attributed to James Joyce? Like, what would that mean? Like, yeah, like, wouldn't that be, like, wouldn't that be enough just to read it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just to be like, oh, well, like, I'll just pretend he read it, or he wrote it, and then I'll just... Cool. Like you could just read the same text. I mean, what he's I'm saying is that like you could read the same text hundreds and hundreds of times, and just, you and you would get like you said different interpretations. Yeah, out just of it. just swap out the author. I think that's absolutely amazing. I think it's a beautiful illustration. I talk about Joyce writing the Book of John or, or Revelations. Or right, whatever. where it's almost like that whole thing where you hear like the desert island book, or like what would you what book would you choose if you're on yeah. a desert island? It's like. Who cares what book if you just attributed a different author to it each time it would be interesting, right? right? So I think that's and I think that goes back to Bart where he says, like, what are we left with, right? We're left with if the author is dead, what are we left with? We're left you know, mm -hmm. the author is dead, long live the reader. Right. Right? So yeah. Everybody so, can have a different experience right. of it. Right. So I think I think we're kind of getting this exaltation of the reader, at least at the end of, of Borges' story. And then, you know, we see that in Bart as well. And maybe that's one of the cool parts about it. You're like, huh, well, what if I... You know, it's just a simple thing, but, you know, you can make a art out of reading, which is, I think, something Borges is so fascinated about. 
I wish we could create an audio essay of this because the thing is, is like there are um, so many different ways that you could go about reading it, right? Like, cause you could, you could have someone voice the Quixote. You could have Cervantes Quixote. You could have someone voice Menard's Quixote. Mm -hmm. You could have um, the narrator in a certain voice. You could have, isn't there a letter? Doesn't Menard write the narrator or something like explain? Yeah, there's a lot of quotations. Yeah, so you could have you could have there. someone voicing. We so we have how many different voices do we have in this piece? We have sure. we have Cervantes, we have Menard, mm -hmm. at posing as Cervantes or doing something. Mm -hmm. Menard in writing a letter, which by its, by the way, we could talk about that as being part. Is that part of the work? Right, we could bring mm -hmm. Foucault in there because Foucault would say, right. what would Foucault say about a letter? That there is no author to a letter, right? Yeah. There's a signer, mm -hmm. but right. there's no author, right? So we've got that. Um, we've got the critics, you know. And so mm -hmm. that raises the interesting question. This is what got us down this rabbit hole to begin with, right? CJ, uh, five weeks ago or something like that, got us reading um, Borges's Borges and I. And we didn't have this background in Bart and Foucault and Derrida. And that was thankfully pointed out to us by Lindsay O'Connor that we needed that to, in order to understand Borges to some degree. So I guess the interesting question is, you know, we looked at Borges and I, and we counted that there could be two or three Borgeses in that flash fiction. Mm -hmm. We've got probably this, we call it, whatever we're calling this, we we'll probably call this flash fiction as well. It's like four pages long. Where's Borges in this? Who's Borges? Is Borges the narrator? Is Borges Menard? Is Borges to be found here? All right. So this is sort of a meta question that causes us to draw right. on the Bart, the Foucault, and the Derrida. Sure. Is um, Borges to be found here, or does he cease to exist once he's posited his writing? Right. Isn't that kind of what Bart was saying that that that, mm -hmm. that the author does not exceed the boundaries of the writing? There's no, he's nowhere to be found. He mm -hmm. he he was there when he did it. Now he's gone, and all that's left is the work. It's kind of like a snake sloughing off its skin. Yeah. We're looking at the skin. The snake is not here anymore. Mm -hmm. And I mean that—that's one thing that's fascinating about Borges is he sort of gives off that sort of energy anyway. At least in a sense. I mean, I I love his little thing. He has this great little little bit. I can't remember what he says. He's like, I I don't I don't care to re I don't care to write as many pages. But I do care, like, if I'm the one that has read the most pages. Like, he doesn't care about writing the most. He's just like, I want to read the most pages. So there's this sense where he's like, he's writing these stories, but it almost seems like you said, like, he's like, I don't care about expressing myself. Or I think in the preface to at least my book of fictions, he's like, why would I write 500 pages? That seems like, like, that seems like such a long, long time. It's pretty time. superfluous, yeah. He's like, that's pretty superfluous. I just want to get the idea out. And then leave, yeah. right? So there's almost this... Art, Borges already wants to kind of escape himself in some way or escape the author function in some way. Yeah. Right? And wants to be the reader again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this yeah. almost seems like... It's like that this is almost some sort of manifesto for maybe how he views these things and maybe his quote-unquote authorship, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, what did you guys... I, I think that's a great view. What did you, what did you guys like about the essay? Were there were there parts of it just not from not from a philosoph? We're not looking for a center. Right. Yeah. Oh, I just don't just aesthetically, <laughs> what did you enjoy about this essay? Why should people take the time to read it? I mean, I love the absurdity. Like, I thought it was just kind of a riot to read because at first I thought it was like you know taking it very seriously and like combing through it, you know, sentence by sentence, and what does he what does he mean? And then I thought, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Hell with it. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna read it. He's messing with you. <laughs> yeah. Right. With all. With all. So with all the precision. He's messing with you. Yeah. Exactly. And then I was like, Ah, oh, yes, Madame So and So, or you know. And then I was like, Baroness, what? Yeah. And then I was like, uh, Oh, now, now I get it, Borges. Like I'm on to you. So yeah. there's that element of playfulness that I that I really appreciate. Well, what do you? So what is this thing? What is this thing that he's satirizing? Right. He's satirizing the act. I don't have an answer for this. Right. Yeah. But he's obviously taking the piss out of academic journals. Yeah. What about academic journals does he find possibly worth satirizing? Is it their pretension? Is it their is it their 
the nature of power relations within it because there's this yeah, person that exactly. that judges Menard's work to be inferior and he has to go and make this case for mm-hmm. for why it needs to be taken more seriously or he, that his reputation can't be I mean is he acknowledging the fundamental human construction of what we consider to be the canon mm-hmm. is that part of it mm-hmm. is that what he's taking the piss out of yeah well that's fascinating that's a mm-hmm. fascinating point maybe like to go out of the satirizing part is that we're given this canon and then he says well actually there's this thing outside of the canon, like to go back to Foucault, yeah. where they're like, this is actually like part of his authorship. It is important. But then there's this other side, too, where Menard even says himself, which is which is fascinating, which I think it kind of touches on Foucault. But he says, um, so my, and this talks about the idea of like, you know, what do you keep? What do you destroy? I guess. And what counts as the author of work? He says, like, I guess in the letter to him or to the author or to the narrator, he says, um, the ultimate goal of a theological or metaphysical demonstration, the external world, God, chance, universal forms, are no less anterior or common than this novel which I am now developing. The only difference is that philosophers publish in pleasant volumes the intermediary stages of their work, and that I have decided to lose them. And in fact, not one page of a rough draft remained to bear witness to this work of years so there's a sense where it's like okay what, what what would happen if like all the rough drafts are destroyed and we're just left with the work does that does that give it more credit does it you know like what sort of function do we give those drafts that were destroyed you know it almost brings back the idea of like you know some people like losing drafts in the fire you know what i mean like you always hear like like so many authors where it's just like they just throw the draft in the fire and then they have to write it again like is that less of a work or more of a work or you know like if what what happens when you omit certain things see i see i got what he was saying uh, maybe and i only read it twice but yeah. i got what he was saying is that he was uh that that this was the like there are no drafts like that th- this is it uh, and right so like because it's fragmentary right like in a way it's finished and unfinished simultaneously right, right. like it is what it is but it's like mm-hmm. like two chapters and a fragment right and this, this is supposed to be considered a masterwork right but i guess he didn't want to like it's like he spent years like he had his drafts of him like trying to write out the Quixote and he wanted to destroy that so then like all he has is the Quixote. Well what does I, that say? If he's just if he's just copying. Well he's not copying. I know we I know you and I going copying. back and forth yeah. on this. He's writing it out and he's like right he's like oh that doesn't sound like the Quixote. Eh, eh, like right. eh, eh, eh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel that semantics are important on, right, on that right. point. I don't know what else to call it because he's doing something revolutionary. It doesn't really have a name, right? Right. He, mm-hmm. he, like, I mean, unless you want to call it appropriating, which has like a slightly less, uh, oh, no. I mean, thieving I, quality to sure. it. Sure. I mean, he's uh, how I put. It, he's producing Don Quixote from his own memory and experiences I think and, and just just from himself if that makes sense like he's taking that spontaneous work and making it his own spontaneous work yeah and well i think we're probably getting you know, the fact that we're like locking horns on it probably illustrates a larger point but let's talk about maybe some some of the other aesthetic qualities that we like to i alluded to all the the highfalutin french names that are throughout <laughs> it right yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is, what about that? Why do you think he did that? And not just French names, philosophers too, right? Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. Uh, did he mention was Leibniz in this? Yeah. Um, there was. I mean, there was like this. Just like there's like an endless name. Garage. There was like I guess there's a lot of name dropping that goes on in this, right? Mm-hmm. And presumably, maybe he's trying to say something about it. How well, academic reputations yeah. are based upon Easily. the number of people that you can quote or cite or relate yourself to, maybe, and that establishes yeah. credibility in some level as well. And I think part of it is just we're kind of he's creating who Pierre Menard is, who is this certain poet working within a certain idiom and a certain frame of mind, which is a certain ideas and then like symbolism like poetry that is based on this movement called symbolism where you have guys like Edgar Allan Poe 
and Arthur Rimbaud. There, there are these certain poets that are so, I mean, this is like, you know, like 1800s, 1700s, 1800s or so, but this, I mean, 1800s, I'm sorry, yeah, like 1800s up to like, you know, 20th century-ish, but mm -hmm. this is, I think, like, using that example, saying, like, this is a guy that's following people like Edgar Allan Poe, and he wants to do what? Don Quixote? Like, a 16th century work? I think, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why he chose Don Quixote and that's like what he illustrates in the book or at least the author does that he's like why did he choose Don Quixote in the first place mm -hmm. and Pierre Menard you know illustrates it's like it's completely useless to me like I can't imagine the world without Edgar Allan Poe I couldn't imagine the world without you know Bato Ivre which is like you know one of Rimbaud's famous poems or like the drunken boat like mm -hmm. but I couldn't you know, I, I could imagine, like, not having Don Quixote at all. And then that, like, and this is, like, where the, the fascinating part happens. He's, like, just having that sort of vague memory of it. And I'll quote it. He says, so, my general memory of Don... And this is Pierre Minardi. He's like, my general memory of Don Quixote, simplified by forgetfulness and indifference, is much the same as the imprecise anterior image of a book not yet written and that is so cool because i mean it's i think using maybe using all those highfalutin names i think it's just supposed to kind of and then just like setting pierre menard up as a certain you know person working within a certain frame of mind and of <laughs> style is supposed to set him so far away from don quixote from a you know renaissance like i don't know renaissance era work what do you say renaissance yeah renaissance like era baroque. work hmm baroque probably yeah renaissance baroque-ish yeah like from that era that to him it's almost like a musical idea where it's like i know of i don't know metallica but maybe i have a very vague idea of metallica and in that i can like try to like you know sometimes you like you know as a guitarist you accidentally like play certain songs you know but you're like i had a vague idea of it I'm a classical guitarist, but I have a vague idea of Metallica, where it's like almost like having a imprecise image of a song not yet written, right? So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think maybe that's why he's trying to he's trying to break off, you know, from Don Quixote so much that it's so much just like a book idea in his head. And then the crazy part is that he's trying to take that vague idea and actually write Don Quixote. That was a long-winded explanation. I hope it somewhat made sense. Well, what are, what are we to make of the fact that he only sampled it? Oh, that he only did like a couple of chapters. Well, I right. mean, that's remarkable in right. itself. Like, so so the, so the, it, this is you know you talked about music, mm -hmm. right? And you talk about maybe like. Uh, Leonard Bernstein doing Mozart, right? Mm -hmm. And like Leonard Bernstein is going to bring all these elements that are Bernsteinian to Mozart that Mozart himself probably would not have brought to it. Okay. But we only have fragments of the score, right? Mm -hmm. So this is actually more probably in keeping with like uh, cut chemist music, sa heavily sampled music, hip hop music, something something to that effect, right? It's not so much what he copies it's what he doesn't copy right and when you exclude by omitting things you know is that it is that what the unique work of art is here is what he didn't do not what so much that he copied but what he didn't copy that's the where he trained his attention mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like when you like when you take like a james brown song and you go hey like that like that that what or something like that and you build it in like there's something captured in that moment and isolated like that you can be in a way said to be an artist because you found that important thing like those those fragmentary passages that he found by just selecting them he brings a certain amount of attention and credibility to him and a different sort of meaning to him that someone who's reading Cervantes line by line all the way through 
in a linear way would not have the same experience, right? Yeah. Like there's something there's something to be said for the fact that it's fragmentary. Yeah. And like mm-hmm. and maybe that is when we talk about this unique symphony yeah. that occurs within us, maybe he's just sampling a symphony and giving rise to something more akin to, akin to like DJ Shadow or Kanye West. How do you feel about that? Do you hate that? I still want to say he's not sampling, but he's just producing the work. Oh, Kanye West is a producer. Oh no 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 no! I mean no no. Pierre Menard is a, is producing the work, but I think you're right in the sense that okay, and then he's producing that those bits at that time, you know, and maybe and maybe it's like the task is just so impossible that all he has is three chapters, right? You know, and maybe that's mm-hmm. what makes it so crazy, and, and maybe that's what makes it so fascinating that like out of his whole corpus. And we get a lot of works that he's done over his life that it would just be three measly chapters like mm-hmm. of this like unfinished like impossible thing, but he was able to like get a glimpse at this impossible sort of journey, but yeah, but maybe there is something to be said about which chapters he transcribed or that <clears throat> he produced at that. <laughs> At that moment, and so, I'm sorry, I got semantics are important. Oh, well, for me to care about the language be, would be anti Deridian, would well, it? Fuck Derrida, yeah. I don't yeah. care. I don't I'm, t- I'm tempted to like bring in another word, but I just don't. I don't even know if I want to wade into the it's all semantic the other word. fray. Uh, no, but no, but the word. I mean, I don't. Know. I tend to think of it in terms of like, I don't know. I want to say like innovation because it's like you still kind of like it's like you're like using the same sort of like building material so to speak but you're fabricating it in a different way so maybe uh menard felt that maybe that's all he needed it's really. bricolage it's bricolage yeah. it's what that's the word it's the, that's the derrida mm-hmm. word is bricolage and that's what elliot did and that's what joyce yeah. does and that's what duchamp does they did bricolage mm-hmm they appropriated and put it together in new ways or in different contexts. So would you say that, so if we had to do this like in an art form, it would almost be the same as if Marcel Duchamp made himself a toilet and that toilet happened to be the same toilet that was on sale at a certain place. But he handcrafted and made it all himself. Yeah. And yet it was the same toilet. Like it's as if like you're like I have a vague idea of a Da Vinci painting, but I've never seen it, and I don't really study Da Vinci. I'm actually a cubist, and I'm actually going to paint Da Vinci and look at look at it. It's it's the same, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm a cubist. Right. So yeah, that's interesting, right? If they're like if the yeah. two toilets were totally indistinguishable, but one was made on an assembly line by robots or fifty people versus yeah. like. An the, the one that I labored over, right? right? We would attach more value and meaning to the one that was handcrafted, would right. we not? Right. right, or that, like you said, like produced in different circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the other thing that's interesting here, and is that we, we go, we shift back and forth. Not only are we shifting between interpretations, and hopefully, some people are like, you know, this is generative in some respect that people could go off and do term papers in different ways with this. <laughs> But the thing is, we're not totally, we don't have a consensus for what the real work is here, right? We should, we are getting into like uh, debates about the Quixote, but really the work under consideration is the bricolage that is what Borges produced, right? He's included a letter from Menard in there. He's included the transcript, the productions of, of the Quixote or whatever. I guess what I'm asking here is like, what's the real work under consideration? Is it the the production of the of Menard's Quixote, or is it Borges taking a step back? It's 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 what Borges is all assembled here, right? The different right. The, 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 the the eulogy mixed mm-hmm. with the letter, mixed with the <laughs> academic journal. That's the big thing. We're get, we're getting we're we're I think what we're doing is we've we've gotten caught up. In the trees and not the forest. Sure. So much. So, I mean, this is an academic essay, right? Is it? Right? Like, that goes back... I don't... I don't th- not so it, not speaking, if we, if we look at it, it's, it is... 
nonfiction fiction, right? Because he the our narrator is talking to us or or is addressing the audience as if we are knowledgeable of Pierre Menard and know who he is and have a general sense of what he is and what he's doing. And it is written, like you said, in this sort of, I don't know, academic way. And it is as if it is a eulogy to this man and saying like, okay, what's his real work? It's this. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's the, the frame that we're working with. And then all those things that you mentioned, the letter and everything sort of fit nice and snug in there in some respect and maybe not. And then we have to say, okay, so who's the author of this work? We don't really get a name of who the who the author of this paper, this paper or this yeah. article is. Would you say Borges is, is the narrator then? Because the narrator is the one who's assembled this this academic. What would you say, Jordan? I don't know. I just think it's like this kind of like crazy chimerical kind of thing. So honestly, I don't know really what to think of it. I think it's like interesting because it seems like Borges and like everywhere in this piece is just kind of like it's like you're just catching someone out the door it's like you kind of think you got him pinned somewhere and then it's like oh there he goes well, that's so I have no idea mm. I have no idea he's, yeah he's written I'm gonna be he, honest about it but that seems know. to be I haven't read a lot of Borges but that seems to be the theme in both things that we've read Borges and I and now mm -hmm. this we we can't find Borges he's elusive and I'm you know what because of Derrida I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I I am remarkably okay with there not being a center. As much as I have struggled with Derrida, it's yeah, he's like teaching me how to just just let be, it go. Just just just, en just enjoy it for what it is. Go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like CJ's in the position where I was where he was like, "No, no, no, there's a deeper thing here." No, no, I'm just trying to examine what he what he's talking about because I mean he even says at least in my prologue um, you know, he's talking about works that are similar to Pierre Menard in this collection but he says um, there, I'll just quote him um, I prefer to write notes upon imaginary books <laughs> so it's almost as if he is like uh, you could make the case that he is that person and he's just he is <laughs> he has made the fiction of Pierre Menard yeah. and of all these people but oh it is goodness. he that's like almost like like entertaining the idea that, that something like this actually existed. He, he's, like, he is making a fake book review for himself. Yeah, because that's the strangest just, thing. Just for kicks? Just for fun, like, it's a game. Oh, he's silly. Like, because it's almost like, I mean, it goes back to that idea where he's like, 500, like, to actually write out a whole book would be too much labor. Mm -hmm. But I can synthesize what that book means and what it's going to do yeah. in, like, five pages by writing an essay on it. So, like, mm -hmm. why would I do that? So, I'm yeah. going to write imaginary book wow. reviews on these books. And like, I'm not going to put an author to it who so are like, oh, is the author Borges? It's just me like, it's a book review. Well, he, accom he accomplishes in a remarkable short space of time, space, space and time, what you, many people would claim that Joyce and Elliot do over much greater lengths. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now yeah. I think Joyce and Elliot believe that they're doing much more than than just this. But there are some people that um that think that, you know, it's essentially the same thing. It's just uh uh creating a chimera like Jordan mentioned earlier, creating some sort of uh Frankenstein. So anyway. So we're coming up on the forty five minute mark. I think I, I've exhausted what I have to say about it. But there is much more to say about it, and I understand that this is a piece of writing that people have essayed and, ironically, probably written many academic essays about that have been published in respectable journals. Um, but I think I kind of i i think I think I had fun exploring it. I mean, I'm glad we did. I'm glad we got got to come full circle with all the the critical theory that we learned. 
Um, so I, I will bow out unless anyone else has something they want to say. No, I mean, that was awesome. You mad that I don't agree with you? Because I don't even I'm know. Delighted. I don't even know if I know what I believe about it. I don't have any strong beliefs about it. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's great that we're... I liked it. It's not even arguing. It's like we're just trying to explore what this is. And we're kind of like, well, maybe this is the way. No, well, that's the way. Like, let's just go down this one path and see what happens. You know? We're almost... I think it's just kind of like a Gordian knot. And I think it just wants you to just accept just like a big... Just heap of string that it's like, oh, okay, good. Now I get it. <laughs> Oh, well, you see, the problem is, like, we're trying to look for the sword to cut it. And just, like, like no, just going to admire that. I just knot. like the heap. <laughs> All right, we got a little extra there. All right, see you later, guys. Download a new app. Bye. Ah, nope, still going.